إنما الأعمال بالنيات which imam began his collection with this hadith anybody huh? imam muslim so imam al nawi collects this hadith as a second hadith which imam collected it as his first hadith imam al imam muslim imam muslim the first hadith in this book it is the first hadith as well in sahih bukhari Second hadith in this book, which is the hadith that we're looking at right now, the hadith of Jibreel. It is the first hadith in the Sahih of Imam Muslim. Tayyib, the context within which this narration was narrated. Who can give us a summary? A summary of the context within which this hadith was narrated. There was a tabi'i by the name of Yahya ibn Ya'mar. So he and his companion, they went to ask the companions of Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam about this new sect that had emerged. Which sect? The Qadariya. Qadariya who deny pre-decree. This sect had emerged. So the companions wanted to, or the tabi'in wanted to find out state of this sect and what is the statement of the companions concerning this sect so then they went off on Umrah or Hajj which companion did they meet which companion did Yahya uh, ibn Ya'mar and uh, uh, Humayd ibn Abdurrahman al-Himyari meet Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma so they met him and they told him that there's a sect that's emerged in Iraq they deny pre-decree. What did Ibn Umar say? What did Ibn Umar say? What was his response to the emergence of this sect that denies pre-decree? Ahsant, I'm free from them, they are free from me. Got nothing to do with them. What else? Something else as well. Ahsant, if they were to give sadaqah, how much sadaqah? Mount Uhud. Mount Uhud, if these people who deny pre decree had gold that is equivalent in size to Mount Uhud, gave it in charity, Allah would not accept that charity up until they believe in Al Qadr. And then after that, Ibn Umar he cites this hadith from Muhammad. This hadith that was narrated to him from his own father. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Tayyib, concerning this here, Shaykh Abdul Muhsin al-Abbad mentioned several points. We'll uh, summarize them to four. One, the emergence of the bid'ah of al-Qadariyah, of the sect known as al-Qadariyah, it occurred in the time of the companions. This sect emerged in the time of the companions in the time of Ibn Umar ta'ala anhuma, who died in the year 73 after Hijrah number two here we can clearly see that the tabi'un what does tabi'un mean? any of the children? there's three here any of the children can tell me what does tabi'un mean? tabi'i so sahabi sahabi a companion of Allah's messenger alayhi salatu wasalam what's a tabi'i? So the one that came after the companions, they are the tabi'um. So here we can clearly see the manhaj of the tabi'in, the methodology employed by the tabi'in, in that they would return back to the companions, Ridwan Allah Ta'ala alayhim, concerning their religious matters, concerning their affairs of the deen. And this is what is obligatory upon us. In the nawazil, in the things that occur within the ummah, in trials and tribulations that occur, we return back to the scholars. We return back to the scholars, the senior scholars, those that are known for their knowledge, known for their يعني, understanding, known for their steadfastness. We return back to them when these nawazil occur, when these occurrences within the ummah occur, these new occurrences within the ummah occur. We go back to them. That's the manhaj of the tabi'in. And we've been commanded to follow their manhaj. We've been commanded to follow the manhaj of the salaf. Early generations of Islam. 
inclusive of that are the tabi'een and this thing that they did when they went back to Ibn Umar that is implementing the statement of Allah when he said fas'alu ahl al-dhikr ask the ask the people of knowledge in kuntum la ta'lamun if you do not know طيب, so that's the second matter that Sheikh Abdul Muhsin he uh, discusses uh, concerning uh, this narration third matter is that the bid'ah of the Qadariyyah, it is one of the most disgusting, repulsive, most evil of bid'ah, most evil of innovations. This innovation of Al-Qadariyyah is one of the most evil of innovations. How? Why? Why does this narration, this incident that occurred between Yahya ibn Ya'mar, uh, Humayd ibn Abd al Himyari, when they met Ibn Umar, and the thing that happened there, the occurrence that occurred there, the things that were said there, how does that indicate how vile the bid'ah of Al-Qadariyah is? Ibn Umar doesn't want nothing to do with them. Huh? Something else? Ahsan, barakallahu feek. It's directly opposing the usul of Imam. And likewise, Ibn Umar anhuma, he said that even if these people gave gold equal to the size of Mount Uhud, none of that would be accepted. All of this shows the, the repugnant nature, the vile nature of this bid'ah. Number four as well is that uh, the mufti, whenever it is the case that he mentions a ruling, then he also mentions alongside it its evidence. This here, this statement of Ibn Umar anhuma, where he refutes the Qadariyya and then he cites the hadith the hadith of Jibreel within which there is a mentioning of Qadr this indicates that the Mufti the one that delivers the verdict when he mentions the hukum, when he mentions the ruling that he mentions the evidence alongside with it evidence that is in accordance to the understanding of the one that he is providing the ruling to Ayyip, so that is second, the second part of Shaykh Abdul Muhsin al-Abbad's explanation to, to this hadith the hadith of Jibreel. We said that it is of 14 parts, uh, rather it is of uh, 12 parts. Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Abbad's explanation is divided into 12. We've covered two. Number three, the third part of Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Abbad's explanation is that this hadith of Jibreel indicates that the angels they can transform into the human form they can transform into human form here we can clearly see it was an angel the angel jibreel the best the best angel changed and transformed into the form of a human being likewise jibreel alayhi salam another time we see in the quran he changes into the form of a human being when when does jibreel alayhi salatu salam in another incident Transform into the form of a human being. It's in the Quran. It's in Surah Maryam. Jibreel That's when the angels. Yes, that, that is also when angels came came in the form of of men. Yes, that's why when they came to Ibrahim and Lut alayhi mas alay So that is angels. There were two angels that came to Ibrahim and Lut alayhi salam and they came in the shape of human beings but specifically I'm asking about Jibra'il alayhi salam when did he transfer, transform into a human being uh, and it's been mentioned in the Quran Tafadal ya akhi Ahsan tabarakallahu feek in Surah Maryam when Jibra'il alayhi salatu salam approached Maryam alayhi salam he came to her in the form of a man so this therefore indicates that angels can take on the form of human beings. That's, that's part number three. Part, num part number four. That is that in the coming of Jibra'il alayhi salatu salam to Muhammad alayhi salatu salam, and that how he sat down and how he asked questions, in that there are indications of the adab of a talib al-ilm. In that there are indications of the etiquettes of a student, of a seeker, of knowledge. So, Jibreel alayhi salatu he comes and he sits 
in front of the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam sat in front of him he didn't sit yani uh, 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 far back so the, this indicator from the adab from the adab from the etiquettes of the uh, seeker of islamic knowledge is that he sits close to the dars not far from the dars as much as possible he sits close to the dars jibril alayhi salatu wasalam فَأَسْنَدَ رُكْبَتَيْهِ إِلَىٰ رُكْبَتَيْهِ In the hadith it's mentioned. He connected his knees, his knees to his knees. Jibra'il alayhi salatu wasalam connected his knees to the, to the knees of the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam showing that he is sitting close to him. So this is from the adab of the talib al-ilm and then many other adab that are taken from that. But what here Shaykh Abdul Muhsin al-Abbad is going to highlight is that the secret of knowledge the student of knowledge, he doesn't have to limit his questions to things that he doesn't know. You don't always have to ask just those things that you don't know. You can also ask those things that you know. Jibra'il alayhi salam, he knew the answers to these questions. But yet in spite of that, he asked them. Why? To benefit others. To benefit others. For that reason. Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, he said at the end of the hadith, Atakum, yu'allimukum, deenakum. Jibra'il came to teach you your religion. Allah's Messenger ascribed the action of teaching to Jibra'il alayhi salatu wasalam. How? Because teaching can be of two types. المباشر له والمتسبب فيه Directly teaching, teaching di directly and likewise Being a cause in being taught Being instrumental in something being taught So here we see Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam No doubt he taught us, why? Because he was المباشر له He was the one that was directly teaching us He was the one that was directly providing the answers Likewise, Jibra'il alayhi salam, he is also considered one who is doing the teaching. Why? Because he is mutasabbib fihi. He is instrumental in teaching. He is the cause, the causer behind the teaching that is taking, that is taking place. And therefore, Jibra'il alayhi or likewise, the one who is mutasabbib, the one that is a cause, the one that is instrumental, in teaching, he might not be one that is directly teaching, but he's instrumental in teaching it. Instrumental in establishing lessons, organizing lessons. That type of person, he will also get the reward for it. A lesson is conducted, but you are the one that established that lesson. You are the one that uh, arranged it. You are the one that invited others towards it. The knowledge that is taught in that lesson, you are going to get the reward for it as well. As the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, Addalu ala al khair kafa'ilihi. The one that indicates towards good, yani goodness, he is like the one that did that goodness. So here we can clearly see that from the adab of, the, of a talib al ilm, is that he sits close to where the lesson is taking place, and likewise, that he doesn't have to restrict and limit himself to asking those things that, he's, that, he, that, that he doesn't know about. You can also ask about those things that you know about, why? So that other people can benefit as well. So for example, you know what the ruling is concerning uh, fasting in the month of Ramadan. But you know that there are people here, that the people in your gathering for example, in a gathering that you might be in, they don't know the ruling. But they might be too shy to ask. So you for example, you put your hand up and you ask the person that you're seeking knowledge from, you ask him, what is the ruling of fasting in the month of Ramadan? Or can you mention the virtues of, man, of fasting in the month of Ramadan? While well, you already know the answer. But you do so, why? Because now the person, he begins, the teacher, he begins to cite the uh, ahkam, the rulings related to Ramadan, the virtues of Ramadan, and the other people benefit. So this is uh, something that we extract from the manner in which Jibra'il alayhi salatu salam sat down. And the manner in which he asked the questions. That's part number four. Part number five. That is concerning when Jibra'il alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, Ya Muhammad, akhbirni anil Islam. 
Oh Muhammad, tell me about Islam. And then the Messenger alayhi salatu wa salam, he said, Al-Islam, an tashhadan la ilaha illallah, wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah, Islam, is to testify, no, God has a right of being worshipped except Allah, and that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah, wa tuqeem as-salah, wa tu'ti al-zakah, wa tasoom al-ramadan, wa ta'hujj al-bayta, in istata'ta ilayhi sabila. And that you establish the prayer, and you give the zakah, and you fast in Ramadan, and that you perform pilgrimage to the house, meaning to the Kaaba, if you are able to do so. طيب. So concerning this, Sheikh Abdul Muhsin al Abbad, he highlights a certain point. And that is concerning the terms of Islam and Iman. Islam, it means. Uh, 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 surrendering and submitting Islam it means surrendering and submitting and therefore on that basis Allah's messenger alayhi salatu was salam explained Islam with these five pillars these five pillars are al-a'mal al-zahira external actions because it's the case that Islam, it means istislam, wal inqiyad, surrendering, submitting. Based upon that, Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, explained Islam and the five pillars of Islam with these external actions. Iman, that is at tasdiq, that is belief, wal i'tiraf, and to acknowledge. That form of belief and that form of Acknowledgement that is manifest, no doubt, becomes manifest upon your tongue, manifest upon your limbs. But it, in the wording of Iman, it means at tasdiq wal i'tiraf, to believe and to acknowledge. And for that reason, the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam explained Iman with these six pillars. These six pillars that are pillars of i'tiqad, of belief. The Messenger explained Iman with these six pillars, these pillars of belief. And therefore he explained Iman with, with A'mal, uh, with hidden matters, hidden actions. Hidden matters and hidden actions. So Islam, it means, or it is in reference to, those matters that are external. Iman, it is in reference to those matters that are internal. However, when it is the case that Islam, the term Islam, Iman, the term Iman, are mentioned by themselves without Iman being mentioned alongside it. Islam is mentioned without Iman being mentioned alongside it. Or Iman is mentioned without Islam being mentioned alongside of it. You see... In the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ayat, within those ayat, the term Islam has been mentioned. In the same context, the term Iman hasn't been mentioned. Or, you see a hadith within which the term Iman has been mentioned. In that context, the word Islam hasn't been mentioned. Just one of them has been mentioned. In that context, one term denotes both terms. Islam in that context means Al-A'mal al-Zahirah wal batina Actions that are inward and actions that are outward. Iman, if you just see the term Iman being mentioned by itself in a certain narration or in an ayah from the book of Allah, and the word Islam hasn't been mentioned in that context, then Iman in that context it means what? Both outward actions and inward actions. However, when it is the case that in a certain context, certain ayat, or a certain hadith, you see the term Islam and Iman being mentioned in the same context, then in that context, Islam has its specific meaning and Iman has its specific meaning. Islam is specific to the external actions and Iman is, inter- is, is uh, specific to the internal actions. So for example, when Allah Jalla wa Ala, He says, وَمَن يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينَ فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْ Whoever pursues and seeks a deen besides Islam, it shall not be accepted from him. Here the term Islam is in reference to 
both Islam and Iman, it's in reference to both external actions and internal actions. And this is common within the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger والسلام, For example, the term Al-Faqir and Al-Miskeen, Faqir and Miskeen, poor and needy, but in, when they are mentioned together, then Faqir has its own definition and Miskeen has its own definition. Or the term Al-Birr wa Taqwa. Al-Birr wa Taqwa, goodness, righteousness, piety. These two terms, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. These two terms, if they are mentioned by themselves, then at taqwa means bir, bir means taqwa. But if they are mentioned together in a certain ayah, mentioned together in a certain narration, then bir has its own definition, uh, definition and ima, uh, uh, taqwa has its own definition. So in a similar fashion, al-iman and islam are two terms. إِذَا اجْتَمَعَا اِفْتَرَقَا وَإِذَا اِفْتَرَقَا اجْتَمَعَا Two terms, when they are mentioned together, both have their own separate meanings. Islam means external actions, and Iman means internal actions. But when they are mentioned separately, when Islam is mentioned by itself in the Quran, by itself in the Sunnah, without the term Iman being mentioned in that context, then Islam it refers to both, the whole of the deen. It refers to external and internal actions. Tayyib. So within part 5, Shaykh Abdul Muhsin al-Abad, he mentions that point, the point about Islam and Iman and the two terms. And then he goes on to explain the shahada. So the shahada, that is the first thing that the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam explained the five pillars of Islam with. The shahada, the two testimonies of faith, both of them are inseparable. To bear witness, no God has the right of being worshipped except Allah. And to bear witness that Muhammad is Allah's messenger. Both of them are inseparable. Both of them necessitate the other. If a person bears witness that no God has the right of being worshipped except Allah, then it goes without saying that he has to accept that Muhammad is a slave and the messenger of Allah. Otherwise, neither of the, neither of the two are accepted. If a person, he bears witness that Muhammad... Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the messenger of Allah Then it goes without saying that Therefore he believes that, Muhammad, that Allah Jalla wa az Alone should be worshipped If a person he says Muhammad Alayhi Salatu Wasallam Is the messenger of Allah But uh, other gods they have the right of being worshipped besides Allah Then that shahada of Muhammad Alayhi Salatu Wasallam being a messenger is rejected Both of the two are inseparable Concerning this, the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ مُحَمَّدٍ بِيَدِهِ لَا يَسْمَعُ بِي أَحَدٌ مِنْ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ يَهُودِيٌ وَلَا نَصْرَانِيٌ ثُمَّ يَمُوتُ وَلَمْ يُؤْمِنْ بِالَّذِي أُرْسِلْتُ بِهِ إِلَّا كَانَ مِنْ أَصْحَابِ النَّارِ Hadith in Sahih Muslim. Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, he swears by he in whose hand is my life, the messenger says. Yani, I swear by Allah. There is no Jew nor a Christian who hears of me but doesn't believe in what I have been sent with except that it's going to be from the companions of the fire of hell. It's very important when you're giving da'wah, for example, to a non-Muslim that you clarify this to him. Sometimes you come across non-Muslims, you come across a Christian, for example, and he'll say, you know, I do believe Muhammad to be a prophet of, of Allah, a prophet of God. I believe in that. The things, the factors that caused me to believe in Moses being a prophet of God and Jacob being a prophet of God. and Those factors, I feel them, I feel them to be present as well with, with Muhammad, in fact, stronger the evidences that indicate Muhammad to be a prophet of God, someone that is receiving divine inspiration from the maker of the entire creation, they seem to be stronger with Muhammad anyhow. So I believe in Muhammad to be a prophet. But uh, he worships Isa alayhi salam. He still, he, you find a lot of the Christians, they might, uh, not a lot of them, but you might find some of them, they'll, they, they, they'll believe in Muhammad as a prophet. They say Muhammad is a prophet, but they don't think that they need to actually embrace Islam. They don't think that they need to say the shahada. They don't think that they need to worship Allah Jalla wa'az alone. 
that they don't need to denounce worshipping Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. So it's very important that these two, these two testimonies of faith are clarified to them. That Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, you believe that he's a prophet, yes? Yes, I believe he's a prophet. Because of the evidences that indicate towards it. I believe Moses to be a prophet. If I believe Moses and Jacob and them to be a prophet, then it goes without saying that I have to believe in Muhammad to be a prophet because the evidences are, strong, are even stronger. You Muslims, you have the isnad, you have a chain of narration and so on and so forth. So mention to him, if he says that he believes in Muhammad to be a prophet, mention to him this narration. You know Muhammad, he said this. It's not the case that Muhammad is a prophet and that you have a choice to follow him or not. No, Muhammad actually said that if you hear of him and you don't believe in him, you don't accept his message, then you're going to be from the, from the inhabitants of the fire, fire of hell. So this is something that is very important to clarify to the Christian, to the Jew and the non-Muslim that realize that Muhammad والسلام, is a prophet. Many of them, they, they, don't, uh, they haven't uh, understood this, this matter. That it's not enough for you to just recognize Muhammad to be a prophet, but you have to accept his message as well. Tayyib. The shahada. The meaning of the shahada. La ilaha illallah. The meaning of la ilaha illallah is la ma'bud haqqun illallah. No God has the right of being worshipped except Allah. No God deserves to be worshipped except Allah. No God is worshipped Truthfully, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of these sentences, they mean they are synonymous. No God is worshipped in truth. No God has a right of being worshipped. No God deserves to be worshipped. Except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the meaning of la ilaha illallah. It does not mean no gods exist. God meaning deity. Deity meaning something that is worshipped. La ilaha illallah, no deity True deity, i.e., no true deity, no rightful deity except Allah. Deities exist. Things are worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sun is worshipped. The moon is worshipped. Prophets are worshipped. Angels are worshipped. And so on and so forth. So do things exist? Do deities exist besides Allah? Yes. So therefore the taqdeer, the implied meaning of the shahada isn't la ma'bud mawjud illallah. No God, no deity exists besides Allah. No. Other deities besides Allah do exist. So the taqdeer of the kalam, the implied meaning of the statement is La ma'bud haqqun illallah. No God, no, there is no God in truth except Allah. There is no deity in truth except Allah. There is no rightful God except Allah. There is no deserved God except Allah. No God is worshipped deservedly, rightfully, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what the statement, la ilaha illallah, means. And for that reason, when the Quraysh, when the Arab pagans heard Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam saying, la ilaha illallah, they knew what it meant. And for that reason, they said, aja'ala al-aliha ilahan wahida, inna hadha la shay'un ujab. Has he made all of the gods into one god? Indeed, this is a strange thing. Because they knew that Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam what he means by this? He means by this, denounce the worship of these false gods because they are not rightful gods. Muhammad والسلام, he was not saying to them, no deities exist except Allah, because it was clear other things were worshipped besides Allah. Lat, Uzza, Manat, false gods existed. The Kuffar, they knew this, the messenger, he saw this. The kuffar, therefore, they understood what Muhammad والسلام, meant by the statement, La ilaha illallah. He meant by this that all of these gods that we're worshipping, these idols and statues that we pray to, that we use as inter intermediaries, none of them deserve it. None of them are rightful possessors of that worship. None of them are worthy of that worship. They understood that La ilaha illallah means La ma'bud bihaq illallah. No God is worshipped in truth except Allah. Tayyib, and la ilaha illallah consists of pillars. If these pillars aren't present, then the shahada it is of no benefit to the one who pronounces it. The two pillars of la ilaha illallah no. is nafyun am wa ithbatun khas. A general negation and a specific affirmation. What does this mean? Meaning, 
you negate, you deny absolutely everything from having a right of worship, from having a right of being prayed to, from having a right of being called upon, from having a right of having supernatural fear of, of having hope in those things that only Allah can give you hope in regards to, of seeking forgiveness from, of seeking deliverance from, that all of these acts of worship, none of that, nothing, nothing has the right of that worship. An absolute negation, nafyun am, an absolute denial of anything having a right of worship. Regardless of whether it's an angel that is close to Allah, whether it's a prophet that Allah Jalla wa sent, whether it's a stone or a statue or the sun or the moon or any of the celestial bodies that we see, none of them have any right for you to call upon them, for you to pray to them. None of them have any right for absolute humiliation, to be humiliated and debased in front of it, and to have absolute love for it, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the two, this is the essence of worship. Uh, absolute Humility and absolute love. The only one that deserves that is Allah. So la ilaha illallah consists of two pillars. The first pillar, nafyun am, absolute negation. Negating absolutely anything and everything from having a right of worship. And then the second pillar, ithbatun khas, a specific affirmation. Meaning uh, uh, affirming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exclusively for worship. Affirming worship exclusively for Allah Jalla wa az, specifically for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is that clear? Right. So that is as far as the shahada is concerned. The shahada and la ilaha illallah. As for the shahada and Muhammad Rasulullah, as for the shahada that Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam is the messenger of Allah, then that is that he, that he is, Shaykh Abdul Muhsin Abad, he mentions, you have. فَوْقَ مَحَبَّتْ كُلِّ مَحْبُوبٍ مِنَ الْخَلْقِ That Allah's Messenger is loved more than anyone else from amongst creation. So all of the human beings, all of the created beings that exist, none of them should be loved more than Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. None of them should be loved more than Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. And that can only occur with ma'rifah. With becoming acquainted with Allah's Messenger. With becoming acquainted with, with Him. Learning about Him. Knowing about Him. What He looked like. What His hair was like. What His face was like. What His hands were like. What His teeth were like. Learning about how He والسلام, would move. How He would sit down. How He والسلام, would sleep. Learning about His mu'amalat. How He would interact with others. Learning about how he alayhi salatu wasalam would worship Allah Jalla wa az. So this love of Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam is wajib. It is a must. It's an ob obligation upon every single Muslim. And that can only occur by you learning about him and acquainting yourself with him. Studying about his, his history and his life story and his characteristics. Alayhi afdalu salatu wasalam. So that is one thing. Shahad of that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, that he is loved to you, more, he is be, more beloved to you than anyone else from creation. Number two, that he is obeyed in every single thing that he commands you with. Number three, that you keep away from everything that he prohibits you from. Number four, that you believe in every single thing that he informs you about. Every single thing that he tells you about from the affairs that are from the affairs of the unseen, those things that you can't see, whether they are things from the past, whether they are things from the future, or whether they are things from the present, those things that are beyond your ability to see. Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu was salam, he has told us about paradise and the fire of hell and that they are created and existing right now. Can you see them? No. But he alayhi salatu was salam, from you bearing witness to him being the messenger of Allah, is you believing in what he has informed you of concerning the matters of the unseen. And the, uh, and the fourth matter, five, fifth matter, sorry, 
is that Allah Jalla wa az, you should only worship him in accordance to what the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam came with. I.e. in accordance to how Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam taught us to worship Allah. You only worship Allah as per the teachings of Al-Mustafa alayhi salatu wasalam. You got that? Anybody want to repeat that? Number one. Shahada that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah. It means, what does it mean? Number one, that he is more beloved to you than, than anyone else, the rest of, rest of creation. Number two, that he is obeyed in everything that he commands. Number three, the children are beating us today. That the uh, that he is obey that he you keep away from everything that he prohibits you from. Number four. That you believe in everything that he has informed you about concerning the matters of the unseen. Fifth matter. You worship when you worship Allah, you make sure that you're worshipping it worshipping him according to the teachings of Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu was salam. Tayyib. How much time have we uh, spent so far in the lesson? Forty three minutes. Tayyib Ikhwan. So what we'll do is we'll uh we'll round upon this, this brief point here, uh which is that ikhlas you you you, you engage in an act of worship. Ikhlas, being sincere in that act of worship and making sure that you're following the Prophet ﷺ in that act, that is what the shahada, the first pillar of Islam, it demands from you. That is what it requires from you. If it is the case that you perform an act and it is devoid of ikhlas or devoid of being in accordance to the sunnah of the Messenger والسلام, then that action is null and void and this is what the first pillar of Islam it requires and it demands from you to be sincere in that action and to make sure that it's in accordance to the sunnah of the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam if it's not sincere then it's rendered null and, null and void as Allah jalla wa ala he has said وَقَدِمْنَا إِلَى مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ هَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا that we uh, turned whatever actions they did and we rendered it into scattered dust or the good deeds that they did that wasn't sincerely for the sake of Allah Allah Jalla wa az will render it into scattered dust on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and likewise as far as the matter of following the Prophet والسلام, is concerned as far as the matter of making sure that your acts of worship are in accordance to the Sunnah then Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam he said man ahdatha fi amrina hadha ma laysa minhu fahuwa rad whoever introduces, whoever invents into this affair of ours, into this deen of ours, يعني, that which is not from it, then that thing will be rejected. Whoever introduces, for example, an act of worship into Islam, that Prophet Muhammad never alayhi salatu salam legislated, then that action will be rejected. Okay, this narration here, it says, man ahdatha, whoever invents, whoever introduces whoever in, invents and introduces into, into this affair of ours, yani into Islam. So this narration here, it is speaking about the one that invents. It is speaking about the one that invents the innovation. Like for example, uh, 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 Ja'ad ibn Dirham, or Jahm ibn Safwan, or Wasil ibn Ata. Uh, these innovators that in, invented their innovations, or Hassan al-Banna, or Sayyid Qutb, these people that invented their innovations, they are the, the, the ones that devise the innovation. This narration is saying whoever invents something into this affair of ours, that which is not from it, then that thing will be rejected. But there's no mentioning of the one that merely practices it. Yani he just practices a bid'ah, practices Mawlid al-Nabawi, he practices the birthday of the Prophet. He himself didn't invent it. 
Is his action still going to be rejected? Yes, why? Still bid'ah. And likewise, there's another narration. Another narration. Another riwayah. Okay, that narration there is this one that we just said. Man ahdatha fi amrina hadha. Whoever innovates something into this affair. So that, in terms of the wording, uh, implies that people like the innovators, those that invented the innovation, devised the concept, they are the ones that enter into this, into this wa'id. And to the fact that their actions are going to be rejected. What about the follower? He doesn't know and he just does the bid'ah of Mawrid al-Nabawi. Or Khatam or something like this. The other narration. Ahsant barakallahu fiqh. مَنْ عَمِلَ عَمَلًا لَيْسَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْرُنَا فَهُوَ رَدْ Whoever does an action now, before whoever invents. The other narration, that's more specific now. Whoever does an action, مَنْ عَمِلَ عَمَلًا Whoever does an action, مَنْ عَمِلَ عَمَلًا لَيْسَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْرُنَا فَهُوَ رَدْ Whoever does an action that is not from our affair, it shall be rejected. The former narration uh, being from Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, the latter one, just being from Sahih, from, from Sahih Muslim. As far as the explanation of the other four pillars of Islam are concerned, zakah, uh, 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 saum, uh, 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 hajj, uh, salah, salah, zakah, saum and hajj, these other four pillars, Shaykh Abdul Masjid al-Abbad, he'll explain them in the next hadith, not in this hadith, okay? And the hadith that comes after it is a hadith specifically on the five pillars. So that is when Shaykh Abdul Mahsin al-Abbad will go on to explain the matters or the pillars of Islam. As far as this hadith is concerned, Shaykh Abdul Mahsin al-Abbad, he focuses on the pillars of Iman and that which comes after it. We shall go into the discussion of the pillars of Iman. Uh, next lesson, inshaAllah ta'ala. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam wa sallallahu ma'ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.